to introduce the Aging with Pride session this morning with Maria, Robert and Barbara from Birmingham LGBT uh, on behalf of Aging Better in Birmingham. Um, and I'm Vicky O'Donoghue, for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm the project lead for the co-production project um, and the main organiser for this festival on behalf of all the Aging Better partners across the network. So I just wanted to um, go through a little bit of housekeeping with you before I hand over to Maria. Um, we're actually on webinar platform uh, this morning, which is slightly different to the usual um, meetings platform. So that means that we, we can't see you, although we can see who's in the room, um, but we can still interact with you through the Q&A and there will be opportunities to ask questions to the panel um, throughout the webinar. So you will see that there's a Q&A chat box available to you. So please do use that to post any questions that come up for you as we go through um, the, the presentation and session this morning. But you can also use the um, general chat box to chat amongst yourselves and introduce yourselves to each other as well. So uh, please do feel free to use that function as well um, for sort of general, general comments. We will be playing a few videos for you this morning. We've, we've done a bit of a sound check this morning and they're coming through a little bit sketchy. They're okay. Um, but Maria's going to share the links with you as well. So if you do have any sort of issues um, seeing and listening to those, then you can, of course, um, play those afterwards. Um, but, but we think they'll be okay. The quality will be okay for, for the presentation. Um, they're just not as uh, flowing as we'd like them to be. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Maria, who will um, signpost the session for you. Um, and I'll be doing the slides. So over to you, Maria. Thank you, Vicky. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maria Hughes. I work for Birmingham LGBT uh, as part of the Aging Better in Birmingham programme. Um, as it's a webinar, we do want to make it a bit more interactive. So we thought we'd ask you some multiple choice questions. So uh, we'll do this in the form of a Zoom poll. So I'm now going to ask Vicky if she wouldn't mind putting up poll question one. And this is about when the first UK Gay Pride March took, took place, which was in London. OK, this takes a little bit of swapping over. <laughs> So please just take a moment to put your put your answers in and then we'll let you know which one's the right answer. Okay. Excellent. So we have a, a neck and neck between 1972 and 1974. Um, the correct answer is 1972. This is when the first official UK Gay Pride Rally was held in London. Thank you. Can we go back to the slides, please. Marvellous. And next slide, please. Thank you. I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of the background to Aging Better in Birmingham before we talk about the specific campaign. Uh, we are one of the 14 programmes across England that was set up by the Big Lottery and hopefully you will know by now that the purpose of Aging Better is to combat isolation and loneliness amongst people aged 50 and over. And in Birmingham we did this by supporting active citizens to set up and develop community-based groups and activities. And you will see some of those citizens uh, in some of the videos that follow. Birmingham is a super diverse city. Uh, we've got um, a, a very diverse mixture of, of people from different faiths, different ethnicities, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, 
age, um, levels of disability, and um, uh, it's a huge local authority. It's the biggest one in Europe. So you can see we had quite a big task on our hands running a programme across Birmingham. So we decided to do this by having some targeted support, as well as a, a city-wide hub, which uh, covered anyone who wanted to get involved in the programme. We did have four priority hubs. Two of them were, were in particular parts of Birmingham, the Sparkbrook and Tyburn wards, and they were picked up because of uh, specific needs people had in those wards. And two particular groups of interest, which were carers and the LGBT community. Um, so this is why there were five hubs. We all worked together uh, as a big team, uh, but each of the hubs has got its own uh, specific um, plans and we take care of specific groups of people. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, tell you a bit about the LGBT hub, which is uh, uh, what we are uh, responsible for. Um, we're based at Birmingham LGBT, which is an award-winning health and wellbeing charity. And amongst the other services we provide, uh, Aging Better provides opportunities for isolated older LGBT people to participate in activities and to encourage them to take a more active role. Um, my role uh, is called the Network Enabler for the LGBT community. Now, as well as working with individual citizens and groups, one of the other uh, things we were asked to do was to look into uh, combating the, the long-term uh, reasons for uh, isolation and loneliness. And we, would, we did this through what's called a local action plan. Uh, we held focus groups, we ran surveys, we talked to a lot of people that we work with um, and alongside, and the results were independently analysed. And one of the things that came out of that piece of research was the need for a public campaign, which we called Aging with Pride. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the first of the videos. This is to introduce uh, why we wanted to work in this way. Thank you. The, the LGBT community is the wide diversity and inclusion because everyone's from different backgrounds, different places, then whoever you are, you're going to be welcomed in. The next part of the campaign is all about bridging the gap, and that's what Generations is part of. So we're part of trying to get older and younger ge generations of LGBT people together to talk about the issues that divide them, and to actually start conversations which will then be targeted at places that can continue the conversations and actually make tangible change to Birmingham's LGBT community. These people paved the way for us to live freely and be who we are today, so I feel like if I see an older person out, I'll speak to them and be like, hey, how's you, how's your day been, like, what's been going on? I just feel that the younger community shouldn't be so judgmental of the elder community because, like I said, they are the originals. Thanks, Vicky. Next slide, please. Here's our next multiple choice question. So, obviously, we need to nip out of our um, presentation and back into poll mode. What was the, when was the age of consent for um, bisexual and heteros um, homosexual men uh, equalised with that heterosexual men, age 16? When did that take place? Thank you. And here it is. Right, okay. So the most popular answer is 2001. Yes, we've got some very learned people in the audience, I think. Um, next slide, please. Uh, it was set by um, at 21 following the Wolfenden Report, which recommended decriminalisation in 1967. It was only lowered to 18 in 1995 and finally to 16 in 2001. And uh, as I was researching all of these dates to get them correct, I discovered that the age of consent for women, regardless of sexual orientation, was set at 16 in 1885. So, um, 
you know, you can see that there's uh, already quite a lot of discrimination between the, uh, the, the sexes in this manner. Right, thank you. Next slide, please. So what was the campaign all about? Well, it was, as all of the work we do in Ageing Better, it was to celebrate older people's lives, and in particular the lives of older LGBT people, and to present positive images, increase the visibility. We wanted to promote positive messages about all the members of the LGBT community from all backgrounds and raise awareness both within and, and without the community of the causes of social isolation uh, and to try and combat these by highlighting positive human interest stories. Uh, we wanted to tackle uh, something that came up time and time again in the research we did which was addressing ageism in the LGBT community. Um, it sometimes astonishes people that where there's a, a community that's been discriminated against that um, it feels like everyone should be in it together but unfortunately there is discrimination within the community as well and ageism was an important issue. Naturally we wanted to challenge homophobia and all stereotypes that can cause social isolation in older age and of course um, with a working in a co-productive way we want to engage volunteers and active citizens. Next slide please. So what did we do? Um, a team of volunteers was recruited from across Birmingham to act as ambassadors and you're going to be meeting two of those in this webinar. They took part in photo and video shoots and, and brought their own unique stories and experiences to the campaign. Um, we did a lot of uh, advertising. Obviously it's a public campaign, we needed to get the message out, out there. So. Uh, as well as using social media channels, uh, we tried to get things out in the public domain. Uh, we saw adverts on buses, on billboards, um, digital screens in various places. Um, and uh, some of our ambassadors went on visits to care homes, for instance, and uh, came to public events. And we, set, we had a load of posters and leaflets produced which we were, were able to send out to get the message out there. And the message was built around the three key messages, really. Keep your rainbow. Getting older shouldn't mean fading away. Keep your rainbow and age with pride. Bridge the gap. Over 50 isn't over the hill. Find out why by bridging the gap between youth and experience. And continue the journey. They fought for our equality. Don't let them drift into the background celebrate our over 50s and continue what they started and one of the most important aspects of the ageing uh, in, in Birmingham campaign and, and work was to bring people of different generations together which um, is what we hope to do in the video you've already seen. Next slide please. So uh, this is just some examples of some of the um, things we put out there in the media. So obviously you can see that we're advertising in uh, what you might call the pink press. Uh, there's a, an online magazine called Queer 40, which we had an interview in and, and Gay Times, but also uh, Birmingham Mail, our local paper, uh, did a piece on us as well. So it was as important to reach people outside the LGBT community as it was inside. Next slide, please. Aha, another question for you, another uh, multiple choice question. So Vicky, if you want to start um, up the poll, please. Um, one of the things that came out through our research quite a lot was um, people being concerned about accessing mainstream services such as health. So this next question is uh, from a survey done by Stonewall. So what percentage of LGBT people aren't out to any healthcare professional about their sexual orientation when seeking general medical care. Let's give you a moment to, uh, to, to put in your answers. Okay, and the majority of uh, come out 25%. Vicky, if you can set the slides up again, please. She's working very hard in the background there. Um, 
the answer is actually not as um, high as you thought, but it is quite high, 19%. So in effect, one in five people um, uh, don't come out to healthcare professionals. And I know some people might think, well, you know, what, what is the, the need to know? Uh, why do healthcare professionals need to know? It's extremely important that, that people can feel that they can um, talk about their, their whole lives, their relationships with other people um, within a, a healthcare setting. Um, the last thing people want to do if they're being seen by a, a doctor or if they're in hospital is to feel that um, they have to worry about who's going to be visiting them and how the staff and patients are going to react to that, for instance. Okay, so we'll have our next video set up if you don't mind, please. Next slide. And we'll see how that runs. I came from a community where drag queens was accepted. I came out in 1978 after quite a long time of not quite being sure who I was. I had those feelings in me, but there was nothing in, yeah. it didn't have anything in the papers. We had the socialist worker at home and it didn't really sort of cover it. I would call myself an activist ever since. As a result, if there was anyone in the family that was gay, that is also accepted. Mm -hmm. I grew up in rural Cornwall, um, so it was a lesson for me to kind of find out who I was and especially how far the LGBT community has come. People don't feel they have to fit into stereotypes so much. There's access to support, there's access to people that are like you. We have an ageing population whose needs are very different. Those voices need to be heard. People before us have been fighting so that we can enjoy the benefits. We don't take anything for granted. We've seen changes where things that we've fought for have gone backward. Things will move on, but you have to be part of that change. Okay, so I, I've, I've done quite a lot of talking and actually the important thing about this campaign is the, um, is the people who were involved in it uh, sort of at the coalface. So I'd like to introduce one of the people you've just seen in the video, uh, Robert, if you wouldn't mind telling us a bit about your experiences, please. Uh, sure thing, Marie. Um, yeah, I'm Robert. Um, I'm a gay man. i out at work. Um, uh, and I was involved in the local network at work. Um, and then got, when I retired at 65, I decided to, I, I got involved with aging, uh, aging, uh, aging better. And as part of that came along this opportunity with uh, aging with pride. <clears throat> the first sort of real connection with that was I got involved in, in the <laughs> evaluation of it, uh, you know, even before it sort of started. So, not only was the the program aging with pride but there was, it was important to evaluate whether it actually made any changes so i was involved in the the pre and post program it was done by an external group who were doing that and we we're advising on the questions that have been asked we're also giving access to to groups where they might be able to distribute the questionnaires <coughs> uh etc uh, for that sort of thing so so that was quite an important sort of quite important role of understanding uh, what the whole aim of, of Aging with Pride was. As you can see, I became a participant. I'm not shy. <laughs> I flashed my face around, as they say, in uh, videos and uh, uh, leaflets and um, uh, bus, uh, bus shelter things. Uh, it was always entertaining. Somebody else spotted it and said, is that, is that you? Uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm not a, I think as I've got older, I've, I've, I'm less of a shrinking violet, um, as they say. Uh, I also walk with the group. We, we, uh, we, in Birmingham, we have a pride. Or <laughs> we used to, we haven't for the last two years, but um, we walk with pride uh, for aging with pride on our, as part of that that large group. Um, it, it's a, a very big festival in Birmingham. It's, uh, 
as many prides are nowadays. Very colourful and very exciting, but very inter intergenerational as well. Uh, so it was, it was quite, inter you know, it's quite a mixed group of people involved in that age of your pride. Uh, as Marie mentioned, we, 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 a part of that thing was one of the, one of the quite interesting things. I visited the three hospices that we have in Birmingham. Um, not something I would I sort of normally sort of think about as uh, I, probably myself in terms of LGBT. Um, but we were going in there to sort of make help help them to become uh, what we might call gay friendly. Um, and that I, in terms of the atmosphere that that's there, and that may be just a bit about where you've got images on the walls and things. You know, you might have, why not have a same sex couple as well as family couples and all that sort of things. Because there, there are a lively sort of sharing place. And of course, a lot of people are dropping in in the daytime because it, it has quite a mixed community there. <clears throat> it's not all end of life um, uh, sort of work there. And also sort of the odd rainbow or whatever. But the really great thing was that it was. It, we were very made welcome. Um, it, the door was already open. So that was quite positive that these organizations were already thinking about how, how, to, how to engage so that somebody, if they were coming end of life, they wouldn't sort of feel then, well, if, I, if my boyfriend or my husband comes in and kisses me, that, that somebody's going to make comment. You know, would I, in, in my, in my end of life, will I feel uncomfortable about how people approach me? And I think that was that was quite an important thing. It's interesting that that you know they, plus some of the other ones in the Midlands hospices, and they were involved in Pride as well. So it's, it was it was good that they were a community look, looking to actually engage. <clears throat> the, the other part I got involved with, I got involved in the interview. Um, for a worker to design LGBT uh, awareness training for care homes. And again, <laughs> we get into that age, I've got a, a stepmother in a, a care home, <laughs> and you know, maybe that <laughs> maybe that's my future. Um, one hopes not yet, just yet. Um, but again, one wants to be able to feel comfortable sort of having the pictures, um, you know, of, of, of of men uh, as as my thing and and all that assumption you know whether you had, you know in terms of, of of your previous life people just assuming that you had a, a female partner or something or whatever um that it, it, it can be seen <coughs> as sort of fairly fairly normal thing and also sometimes being sensitive to those different things because there are married couples and they the, taking it for a say the male the feet his his wife dies <clears throat> and he then decides to have a, a male partner at, at the end of life but doesn't tell the rest of the family and having to do with those sorts of issues in a care home I think you know be, that sensitivity and understanding of how these things are uh, still in society um it's got a bit mixed. It got a bit uh, frustrated by COVID, but was it's still working on it in terms of that looking for that delivery partner to do that. And I, I, I feel that's one of the, the very important contributions that this aging with pride has done is is looking at that that sort of broader spectrum of of society. It's not just purely about us as LGBT feeling great at age. We want to share that and say. And I think it may be that part of that, you know, it's just I want, I want other people to understand how I'm going. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Robert. Um, that, that's given us, a, it's a lot to think about. And I think that, as Robert says, although COVID uh, put a bit of a, a stymie on the work we were doing, you know, all, all of the people that we've worked with are very keen to sort of get up and running with um, uh, the, this campaign aims again as soon as we possibly can. Right, uh, it's time for another question. So, Vicky, if you wouldn't mind working your magic in the background, please. This question is asking about the percentage of transgender people who've experienced a hate crime or incident because of their gender identity over the, the previous 12 month period. And again, 
this is from some research um, by Stonewall. So we'll see the poll any minute now and ask you to vote for your the answer you think is correct. Right, okay, if we can go back to the slides, please. Um, yes, unfortunately, this time around, the correct answer is 41%. Um, it is the highest. And, you know, this is obviously uh, one of the things that we are very concerned about, and we want to um, ensure that, that people who experience any uh, hate crime, whether it's related to their gender identity or sexual orientation, is supported. Next slide, please. And if you can play the video, thank you. There is more work to be done, of course. Not all communities are, are accepting. It's taken like 28, 28 years, maybe more, for mm. us to say, you know what, there are other people who identify as LGBT, yeah. but they happen to be of a different race mm -hmm. or a different ethnicity or culture. I think the only way to get rid of that is to have interaction and to have it truly happen on a face-to-face -face basis, because without conversation, then things get imagined, divisions get exaggerated. I find yeah. my, my nephews, they'll ask me questions, very straightforward, yeah. shocking questions, and then go off on a tangent about some toy. Whereas 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't know what to say to them. Now you can discuss it quite openly. Yeah. Education in schools also is really important because um, homophobic bullying is still definitely yes. a thing uh, and needs to be tackled as well. Always going to get these individual hassles that pop up where people refuse to in actual fact not change but accept that diversity is here to stay. The point of view I want is basically that a trans person will be just looked like a, as any other person that they'll get the health care they need, they'll get the gender affirming procedures they need. Um, I've been involved with some asylum seekers and refugees it's still in many many countries very, uh, it's illegal. Imprisonment, that can mean flogging, that can mean a death sentence just for being who you are and loving who you want. Women are, across the world often, are treated as chattel and, uh, you know, all sorts of horrible things have happened to them. I'd like to see a lot more work trying to influence other countries to be more understanding about their lesbian and gay and trans citizens. But what I love about it is when they come to the LGBT centre um, they're able to be who they are with pride. The more we can celebrate our history, remember our roots and allow that to inform how we develop and evolve, the better for everyone. Uh, a little bit from uh, Barbara, our other guest speaker today. So I'm going to hand uh, the microphone, as it were, over to Barbara to tell us about her experiences. Thank you, Maria. I've, uh, I, um, I'm 68. I've been retired since I was 60. I was quite lucky. But back in the day with me, the thing that you did to leave home respectfully, you got married. And uh, I married a man, obviously. And there's a lot of lesbians that I know of my age that did, did marry but I came to um, the conclusion that it wasn't right for me when I was uh, what, about 25, 26 and uh, I, uh, I came out straight away um, basically because um, I feel that you've got to be proud of what you are, who you are if you if you're not proud, then you know you need to change, change how you do sort of things. And um, I, I was in the civil service, and um, when I came out to my boss, he put me on his back of his motorbike, drove me out to Tamworth, and said to me, uh, "Give me a couple of a couple of pints of beer." And he said to me, "You're too good looking to be one of them lezzies." 
because that, that was the thing back in the day it was, you know, if you were a lesbian because you, couldn't, you were too ugly to get a bloke. <laughs> uh, but things have changed a lot since then. And I think that, you know, that the thing that I've took with me all my life is to make sure that you, that you um, inform people, keep them in, you know, I'm, I'm out and proud, keep them informed about, about yourself and then get them to learn sort of different things. I used to take a lot of my straight um, girl colleagues to the gay clubs because I used to love dancing with the uh, with the gay blokes because they smelt nice and they dressed better and they didn't come on to them sort of stuff. So I think the Aging with Pride um, initiative is, is, is brilliant really because there's a lot of people that are, are not as fortunate as me to, have, to, to be out and proud in their community and it's this helps people, gives them um, the confidence, if you like, to, to, to come out in their community. And it's more difficult, I think, in, in certain groups, you know, uh, you know, sort of if you do different religions, or some religions are a lot more harsher about, about um, homosexuality than, than others. Um, I've, um, I've been to a couple of care homes and stuff, and talk to the to the staff there. They've had staff meetings, and there are care homes are now getting a lot more, as, as as Robert said, a lot more accepting and understanding. And you you do see uh, um, quite a lot of rainbow flags around, which I think is you know is a is a great way of actually showing that they're they're accepting of of different sexualities. Um, I think. Just to talk about what else. The the, uh, the the thing is that, that um, I mean I'm not my gay is not very good anyway. I, I never I never make assumptions about people. But the thing is, if you're out and proud and, and working amongst your community, which I which I do do, then um, then that's the, the best way to do it. And I'm I've got to say I'm, I'm accepted and uh, and valued by my local community as well as. You know, uh, through the people that I meet, through the, the gay scene in Birmingham. But yeah, and as like as Robert says, the gay scene is a lot is a lot more old age friendly now than it than it was. But it needs to move a bit further. So from there, but uh, we, you know, you got to keep the job going. Hope that's okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and uh, obviously. Um, people are going to have the opportunity through the Q&A box to come back to both of you and if they've got any specific questions um, about what you've uh, you've experienced um, and as you see you know I think one of the aims of this campaign was to um, combat the ageism within the LGBT community and as Barbara said that seems to be uh, starting to have some traction which is brilliant Right, so what did happen next in the campaign? Next slide, please, Vicky. Thank you. So uh, there was continuous evaluation all the way through uh, the campaign and uh, a final report was um, created. And it was, it was to see if it had been effective in raising awareness of, of ageing and its issues and if it helped increase understanding and respect for old LG people within the LGBT community and outside of it, of course. One of the participants of the evaluation said that uh, LGBT people today do not have to remain hidden to the extent that they used to and can be part of their wider community, which has to be welcomed. Nothing is perfect, of course, but the journey is being made in the right direction, which reflects what Barbara just said as well. So uh, the, one of the conclusions of the report was that Ageing with Pride has clearly raised awareness as to ageing and the risk of isolation amongst the older LGBT community and gone some way to changing attitudes with significant increases in awareness about the risk of social isolation for LGBT people in later life. And our Ageing with Pride ambassadors, uh, Robert and Barbara here today and others that are involved as well, are still engaged with the Ageing Better in Birmingham programme as members of its Age of Experience group. Um, this was a, a group of older people from across Birmingham, all the diverse communities, 
that was set up right at the start of the Ageing Better in Birmingham programme. Um, they've been involved in co-production and co-design uh, all the way through the programme and um, have, as you can see, have helped not only as part of the Ageing with Pride campaign, but also helped uh, with the uh, monitoring and, and evaluation of it uh, to make sure it was effective. Right, I have one more poll question for you. Um, so, Vicky, if you don't mind um, setting that up, please. So, um, as part of a national um, programme, the Ageing Better programme has to report to a national evaluator, ECHORIS. And um, so this question, the, the answer to this question comes from their research. So what percentage of LGBT participants in the Ageing Better in Birmingham programme said their loneliness and isolation had improved due to participation? And by improved, I meant they got less lonely and isolated. OK, let's see how we do this. Um, uh, people are very optimistic and not going for the lower numbers as yet. Okay. Yes. You're absolutely correct. It is 41 percent and the majority of you said that. Thank you. Um, if we can go back to the slides, please. So we've come to the end of our presentation. Uh, and so it's over to you, our audience, if you want to put any questions in the Q&A box. There aren't any questions at the moment. Uh, I have I can ask Barbara and Robert some questions if you prefer. Um, <laughs> but I think they're primed and ready. Um, okay, so um, is, is there anything that either of you would like to add uh, to what you've said um, and, you know, a, about your focusing on your experiences as, as ambassadors, as people who were sort of taking forward this campaign. I, I think it's, yes, being an ambassador or whatever it is. I mean, I, I've, I, I've, being a gay man is part of me. It's not the only thing that's there. Um, but I, I'm happy to discuss those sort of the, the gay politics or whatever it is with people I meet in social, uh, social activities or whatever it is. Um, and to be involved in things that maybe that are going to impact um, on me and, and, and contributing sometimes at, simply as a citizen of Birmingham, but also a citizen that happens to come from a gay background, which may have an impact on, say, health services or whatever it is. So I think, or transport or whatever it is, not everything is, is LGBT, uh, you, know, you know, whether they close a road what's the gay thing but I mean I, I do feel that there is it's important that as well as as a community that we actually participate in 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 the uh, more social world as well um, so that we can um, uh, do things like do uh, you know give our give our expressions of, of, of our thoughts and feelings which helps those who are in the uh, you know, making those decisions in terms of uh, spending uh, 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 hard-earned taxes. Yeah. yeah, I think I've, been, I've, well, I've enjoyed about it really. I mean, I've enjoyed a lot of things about it, but it stopped me getting isolated. And um, it's great to meet people from all over over Brom, from different backgrounds, different heritage, and actually. Talk to people about uh, about about your sexuality because, as I say, I've uh, you know, been out in proud since I was twenty five, um, and get them to understand more. And if they get to know you first as an individual, and they like you as an individual, then accepting your sexuality, I think, is is fine. You know, it's not a problem, is that? So, uh, but uh, that's um, I, 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 that's where I've enjoyed my experiences. But, uh, Thank you. And I know, I know, Barbara, that um, aside from this campaign, you've, you've also been uh, uh, involved in uh, the Ageing Better LGBT housing group. Yes, uh, and that that's you've right, also yes. uh, gone to speak to staff at a housing association as well. How did that go? 
it went very well actually but yeah you could tell that they were they were looking at themselves and going I never thought of that you know so you could see people sort of thinking that's a bit of information that's, that's something I didn't know about I think um you know the more you talk to somebody about your experience and other people's experiences the more they learn about the diversity and you know where people come from what issues they have all sorts of things you don't make assumptions you, know, you, you ask the questions and you listen to the to the answers and I think I'm hoping that that's the that, that I've made that step forward with a, with, a, with a few people like that I think that sort of those, those sort of uh, places are the, are the best place to, to do it you know where they feel comfortable in where they work but you can talk to them about things outside of their normal sort of agenda. Um, actually, uh, uh, Claire from Opening Doors London has asked a question um, about the experiences of visiting care homes. Did you approach them or do did they invite you? Um, I think they might have invited me. I'm not sure now because I think it, this was organised through Rico. Um, so I can't, I can't remember for, for I mean, for, for one care home, because I happen to know the care home manager. Um, uh, huh. So I had that discussion because it, because it's a Care Quality Commission. Uh, one of the things that's on their sort of uh, list is, is actually about whether it's a, a LGBT friendly place. Um, and this is a friend who knows <laughs> that I'm gay. So we had that discussion and, and then I... I introduced them to uh, the LGBT centre and I think people went in there actually to, to do that. So I think it's both ways, but now we've, at, but then we sort of, that's been developed to fund actually uh, a person to go and then talk directly to that community. Either via, you know, also I think probably using their links within the city council because obviously the city council has an ex, ex, ex um, the curate manager who, who, who did all that sort of thing about you, you, number of organisations and, and therefore going through the council, one can also try to try to develop that in, in together with, with the, those care homes. Um, but you probably know more about that, Marie, in terms of that programme that was that was then funded. Yes, uh, I can say that uh, as somebody who worked alongside the campaign, uh, although not running the campaign, uh, I'd already made contacts with um, care homes and similar uh, providers in Birmingham. Um, again, through the Aging Better LGBT Housing Group as part of that, and hospices as well. So we'd already got a bit of a relationship with them. And um, so when the time came to think about, OK, where should we, who should we ask? Where should we get ourselves invited to? We already had a bit of an idea where to run with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and talking of the care homes, someone from Alive Activities has asked, um, Robert, you said about training in care homes, what would be your top tips for making care homes more inclusive? And obviously I'm going to throw that question open to both of you. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it's just, being, it, it is that awareness sort of thing that sort of, it's just the approach you make to people is that sort of don't making assumptions you know that that person about a person's life and the pictures they're doing and saying oh oh are they, is this your son or brother or something rather than you know this oh no this is my partner um it's those sorts of things that are trying to avoid making those assumptions about about that and and not and and also that sort of there is the acceptance that if a partner comes in and and kisses you know that there is how you deal with that sort of thing in in a care home i'm i have I, you know have a boyfriend and if i want to kiss him in a restaurant i will do um and if i end up in a care home in, unless my brain's totally gone um i would probably still want to do that and and it, it, it's sort of that acceptance and not something that's like oh it, and it, it's making that atmosphere where, where one can feel comfortable with that. Um, but there's also then the awareness for, for people who are, who are older as well, 
going into that environment of, of being sort of honest with them, trying to help them to be honest with themselves so that they can relax and, and enjoy the experience of being in, whether it's a care home or whether it's sort of a, 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 um, a, a supported living type environment, that they can be honest with themselves and, and feel comfortable. Do you have anything to, to add to that, Barbara? Your top tips for a very <laughs> friendly care home? I think I think Rob's right. I mean, there are, there are as you say, Marie, we've had involvement from quite a few uh, care home companies and uh, they've learned a lot. And some of them are obviously more geared up for, to accept for this acceptance than, 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 than others. But I think there's a, there's a move towards towards that acceptance and that and that understanding that you know as it, as, as it says really you can't it's difficult for, for for some people because they've never experienced gay people maybe or don't think they have for them to accept as a carer that, that somebody could be uh, you know uh, um, a gay man or a lesbian um uh, it's 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 it's, edu it's, all, it's all to do with education uh, but it's it's actually making sure as well, I suppose, that the individual that we're talking about is, is confident enough to come out uh, about that. And, you know, I, I feel confident enough. Robert feels confident enough, but not everybody does. So it is, it is, it is difficult for some people, but you've got to be proud of yourself, proud of what you are, who you are. Try to be. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And I, I, I would add to that and make the point that nobody's asking for, for if you like, special treatment. Uh, the fact is that um, in, in Birmingham, as you've said, a super diverse community, there are going to be people in care homes from a range of, of ethnicities, uh, faiths. They're going to have different health needs, you know, and, and all we're asking is to be part of the recognition of that diversity. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, m making sure that that um, anyone that feel feel should be, feel comfortable to say, you know, um, I'm a, I'm a Muslim and I'm now celebrating Eid. I'm a Sikh and I'm celebrating Vasaki. I'm mm -hmm. a gay person and I'm celebrating Gay Pride. It's all part of the same thing. Yeah. It's 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 part of recognising diversity mm. uh, across the board. Yeah, um, and of course, I could I could be a Muslim and I'm gay. Exactly. And, you know, we're seeking, okay? Precisely. But, yeah. uh, and uh, I think, uh, as you say, it's quite important to to recognise that people n might not feel safe. So it's no good waiting for them to tell you. Um, you need to create the atmosphere that makes people feel safe to disclose. And yeah. that could be that, and everything from the posters on the walls to... <laughs> to the, to the, the policies for people who actually go into these facilities. And I know, for instance, um, the Anchor Hanover Housing Association, as we know, they ask potential new residents, they tell potential new residents that they're LGBT affirmative. And basically that if the person is not comfortable with that, then they're not going to be comfortable with that housing association because that's how they're going to be. So yeah. I think... Um, I would say it needs to be really from the top to the bottom of the whole agency um, needs to be behind supporting people from diverse communities. Um, Marvellous. Uh, we've There's been a message in the chat uh, saying thank you for today. We're a shining example to other cities and um, hopefully when they're uh, granddaughter is older, the world will be a wiser place. And uh, again, I think that's true. I think the the generation now who are possibly fearful of being uh, out and proud as you are in the community, um, hopefully generations to come will look at the examples you've set and it, uh, society will change for the better and people won't feel the need to be so uh, fearful of others. Uh, I think that's quite a uh, a positive message. We don't yeah. seem to have any more uh, questions um, mm. in the chat or Q and A. Um, so I think we hopefully will enjoy to a close there. I do encourage people who have um, watched the videos to click on the link 
um, because there are more videos on that, the, the Asian with Pride channel as well, you might be interested in. And if you've got any uh, questions you want to ask me about the campaign, um, my email is also in there as well. Okay, um, Vicky, did you want to round up the end? Thank you so much um, for a really yeah. inspiring and heartwarming session, actually. It was so lovely to hear more about the campaign. Um, and I actually went through a whole range of emotions whilst listening to that presentation and to listening to your stories and, you know, your, your sort of openness and honesty, um, sort of from sadness through to elation. And um, I was laughing out loud at one point with uh, Barbara's sort of way of putting things across in terms of her experiences. That was, uh, that was funny. Um, and I'm loving that Robert sort of just, you know, around the city in, in, in bush shelters and various uh, on various posters <laughs> next time i come to birmingham i'm going to be looking out for you that's <laughs> you, you used to be a very derogative thing you say I'm, I'm on the back of the bus <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> but no that's fantastic and um, i know that this is part of a number of sessions that um coming to the festival from Aging Better in, in Birmingham as well. We've got another one this afternoon on uh, co-production within a super diverse city, which of course you absolutely are and are a shining example, um, as uh, Judith said. And then we have um, another session around working um, with the BAME community as well um, tomorrow. So still lots to come, but yes, thank you so much to all of you for such a fantastic session.